Burr, sorry to cut you off there. That's okay. I don't know how I'm going to, um, how I'm going to compete with cannabis, uh, but we'll give it a whirl. So every four years when a new administration comes in, <clears throat> the National Intelligence Council does a report on uh, their vision of the future uh, called Global Trends. And this year, the theme is a contested world. And what they try and do is do two things in the, with the report. They identify and assess the broad factors shaping the environment that we live in globally. And also, then they try and figure out how populations and governments will react to that and act and respond on it. Uh, the report was just released last week. It's 177 pages. Uh, it's really uh, interesting. I'll put it into the chat room a little bit later uh, so you don't have to go searching for it. But basically 19 government agencies put their thoughts together on what they think the most important things happening going forward are and what are the, some of the scenarios that play out as to how the world responds to it. <clears throat> and uh, this year with the pandemic, you've actually had a, a new shift to it. And what happened in their 08 report, they started talking about pandemics being a big uh, concern and we really didn't respond to that very well. So it's all out there. They, they've started this in, I believe, 1997. And what they are really trying to focus on are, are the structural forces that are at play, emerging trends, and then what are the scenarios that play out in the future? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so there are five big themes and then we'll get into the other areas, but uh, really what they found with the pandemic was it was uh, accelerating and uh, actually reinforcing trends, both positive and negative that were in place before COVID. On the positive side, uh, you know, we had this big technology transition that's going on. Um, so that was catalyzed, the pandemics catalyzed a lot of the economic trends that were in place. It started to reinforce uh, the nationalism and protectionism themes that were so prevalent the last several years. Um, it's also about the inequality issues that have continued uh, among others. So there's a, a couple scenarios there. And on the negative side, you know, we've had this, um, we were making a lot of progress on human development, particularly not, not necessarily in the developed world, but in the developing world, <laughs> where over two and a half billion people have been pulled out of poverty uh, over, the, over the last 20 years. And uh, what the worry is, is that that's gonna reverse itself. That living standards, which had been on the rise are going to be degraded. And then uh, <clears throat> also that we've gonna have more and more of these disasters like we've had, whether it's health or environmental uh, disasters, and, and then it's, is it gonna reverse the trends of closing the inequality gap and the gender gaps that existed? So those are the kind of things that were on their mind. What they really found was the pandemic has really uh, created issues that um, are gonna be longer lived than, than we thought. So uh, there's a lot of big issues to deal with. And what that means is there's also gonna be a lot of potential scenarios to play out when we get there. So let's jump into the themes. So shared global challenges, the ones we talk about on a regular basis here, whether it's climate, uh, food and water security. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Part of the problem with uh, what's going on with the uh, mining of bitcoins is the water supply areas in certain parts of China. And yet, where are we putting the new fabs for uh, Samsung and, and uh, Toshiba are going into parts of the U.S. that are not known for their excess water supplies being the southwest. So we had those issues that are only going to continue to grow as the population gets bigger. You're going to see increased migration. We had <clears throat> about 270 million people, according to the UN, are living in countries other where, they, other where they were born. And what you're seeing right now is that's an increase in the last 20 years of 100 million people. And what we're seeing with these health issues could, is that number going to pick up even more? And not only health issues, but uh, geopolitical issues that are creating uh, bigger challenges. We have new health issues where uh, the pandemic has added to uh, other problems, including biodiversity losses. And then you have technology, which is going to both augment uh, longer term the employment opportunities, but in the short term, create big challenges. Fragmentation is another theme where we're much more connected on a global level, but we're much more divided locally. And I, I make the analogy of being stuck in an elevator with a bunch of people for an extended period of time. You're really close, but that doesn't mean you're going to get any uh, more friendly uh, while you're there. And I think that's what we're seeing in different parts of the world. And you're seeing that in politics around the world. 
um, communications and trade and all that are going to <clears throat> add to the issue of fragmentation because uh, what you saw with the change that uh, former President Trump put in place uh, for global trade, that's actually changes a lot of the way we operate and it's creating bigger strains. The disequilibrium is they're all related too, which is so fascinating, but I've talked about the six transformations that our firm has been focused on. And what we're seeing is that the, the transformations are um, far beyond what the ability of our governments are and uh, leaders are to manage that, whether it's uh, governments or businesses or uh, other institutions, that the needs and the desires are mismatched right now. And, uh, and the ability of governments to respond because of the financial crisis and then the pandemic their finances are stretched. So that creates even more problems. So you have growing unrest and growing frustration with governments. And you're seeing that playing out right now in countries like Germany with their elections where uh, a Green Party first time getting nominated for uh, chancellor. And what does that mean? And what does that happen to the existing parties? And that's just one example, but look around the world. So it's getting increasingly difficult to address the challenges the more divided your societies get. And just look at Washington, D.C. as an example of that. So we're more connected, but we're more fragmented at the same time, which actually makes it harder to get the right policies in place to effectively deal with the challenges. And then you have these <clears throat> issues where the world is fracturing and populations are starting to divide themselves by identity rather than na national uh, issues. And even in our country, you're seeing it uh, in a very play out in a very big way. And so what you're getting is more demands on the government from populations, but they're more diverse demands. You're having governments have a harder time identifying what they're gonna agree on um, and focus on and prioritize. So you're getting more contentious and volatile political environments, which makes it harder to do the longer term planning that Michael Fields was talking about in the lead in today. And so if you can't plan for the long term, how do you deal with long term issues if you're doing the st uh, start and stops all the time? Major powers are positioning themselves to create new rules too and then exploit them. And there's the battle for who's gonna control 5G. That's a part of that. Who dominates the tech world? Who dominates innovation? Who controls the standards? Those are all issues that are playing out that are gonna be really critical to see how that uh, evolves. And then lastly, the, the big uh, trend here is um, adaptation. And how do we, uh, that's spelt wrong, by the way. How do we change to uh, evolve for where we want to go? Um, it'll be critical for uh, changes to happen both on a global basis and a local basis and even on a na and national and regional basis. And how do we manage those transitions and who gains the competitive advantage around that? And one of the key takeaways from the, this report <laughs> is that the winners will be those that can build consensus and rebuild trust towards collective action. And look around the world and how hard that is for, for people to get behind the governing institutions that have been in place for so long. So that creates a, a great deal of uncertainty. From the structural side, you have human development and demographics is a big challenge and you're getting population growth and population aging occurring at a very rapid rate at the same time, but where that's happening is very une uneven. And you're getting parts of Europe and uh, East Asia that are gonna grow very fast, and that's gonna slow economic growth and grow older very fast, slowing economic growth. And a lot of the countries now are uh, fighting immigration, which is gonna be necessary for them to backfill if they can't do it all through technology. And we know in, because of the servicing needs of an older population, you can't do that all with robotics. You need a human touch. So how do we get the human development going on? And at the same time, as we're bringing all these people out of poverty, inequality is getting even bigger. So the policy mismatches to the needs are growing even greater. And that's, a, that's one of the takeaways from the report. And while progress has been made, how do we get to the next level of development is gonna be much harder. You know, the next 2 billion people coming out of poverty is gonna be far more difficult than the first 2 billion. And, th and that means the strains on governments to deliver are gonna be higher because people are gonna want more. And as you have those mismatches continue, it puts more pressure on short-termism as opposed to doing the right thing for the long-term because around the world, people want immediate gratification. So how do we fix infrastructure, education and immigration policies and how you put them in place to be 
uh, practical, meaningful, and productive are really going to be critical. And you have to balance off the needs of the short and the long term there to do it right. And so our take is greater diverge, uh, divergences and disparities among nations and inside nations. Um, that's going to be really fascinating to see how it plays out. We know the weather issues, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but capital is being drawn there to reduce the near and long term risk. But uh, certain countries, the developing areas, are going to be disproportionately impacted by the extremes of weather, by drought and other conditions that come with that, that go back to the food source and the ability to, to grow. And that's going to happen at the same time as more urbanization comes in, putting greater strains on, the, on those economies. The economic trends that we're dealing with are the ones we talk about on a regular basis, but the rising debt loads, which then holds back countries from being able to make the investments that they need. Some other countries making the investments that they, uh, companies that they need to make the investments. If you have high debt loads, it's hard to make long-term investments because you're only going to increase your debt, worsening your financial position. And, and if you don't get the immediate response, then the government, new government comes in and you get taken out. Large platform companies like the tech companies are going to drive trade on a global basis and they're going to help smaller firms grow. And we've seen that with uh, Amazon. You've seen that with uh, uh, Alibaba and Tencent and, uh, and other, uh, other big platform companies like that. That's going to have a big impact on how you help the uh, smaller areas grow. But it also means that if you're not an innovation leader, how do you, how do you move forward? And we're in a world where a declining population puts even more stress on productivity growth to be more effective. So that's another key element. So the big theme is how do you be more productive against these structural forces? And technology is clearly one of the ways you do that. It helps improve productivity and mitigate some of the problems, but we know it's creating other problems, whether it's regulatory issues, whether it's competitive issues, or whether it's job issues. Um, so creative destruction is going to be ongoing. It's going to create even greater strains and bigger tensions. Um, for all the good it does, those are uh, some of the byproducts of it. And we've been long held, anyone who's been on these calls knows that we believe the rate of change is going to, is far beyond what people are expecting it to be. And therefore their, their willingness to adapt is going to be slow. So if you don't have the mindset that rate of change is going to be high and you need to be moving and changing and evolving at a, at a higher pace than we have been, you're going to be left behind because those are the new tensions that are going to be created. And then you have state and non-state people that are going to try and uh, buy for leadership, whether it's companies or, uh, you know, people like the Gates Foundation. And it's not all negative. They're just trying to drive agendas forward that are going to have meaningful impact. So the second part of the report, uh, the third part of the report is really on what are the scenarios? How could this play out 20 years from now? So they list five uh, and one of the interesting things is because they're government agencies, uh, they can't prescribe what the policy should be. They can only define what they see as the potential outcomes. So they're not giving policy prescriptions here, but these are the five scenarios they see play out. The first one is that you get a renaissance of the democratic uh, democracies uh, because they're going to work better with corporations to drive tech advances, harness the problems, identify them, and then you're going to get growth and innovation, which will ease, ease the tensions, renew trust. And then the opposite side of that could, that could play out is that the increase in controls, that, societal controls and the monitoring that's being done by China and Russia, for example, lead to stifling of innovation, which then has capital outflows of uh, human talent that uh, drives the innovation because they can't perform the way they want to perform. So that's one scenario. These are not one over the other. These are just the five they play out. The second one is that you start to see the international order disrupted completely by bad actors ignoring the rules. An example of that could be that the um, uh, North Koreans have one of the finest hacking uh, armies in the world. Um, they can be highly disruptive for, for a small uh, country that has struck so many struggles. Um, they can be one of the more disruptive uh, actors out there, and you can see that play out. There are other small nations or even bigger nations that can be really bad actors, and I, I don't leave out any of the developed nations in that, including the U.S., potentially being part of the bad actors who start to ignore governing rules. The OECD then has to figure out when you're dealing with slow growth, 
um, demographic challenges, growing political divisions. How do you move forward with the right policies? And that set allows people to step into the void and play a, um, a, play a bigger role in trying to disrupt things to their advantage. In this scenario, they don't believe that China will they'll lead, but they'll have a bigger role, but they won't be able to take on the rest of the world the way people might fear right now because of either the lack of will, their internal problems, or the, do they have the military strength to take on other people in a, in a material way? We think they're moving that way to where they have the capabilities, but do they have the desire to get involved in long-term conflicts? They seem to want to do more with uh, uh, economic influence but there's a leadership void that's gonna hurt the developing nations most and affect their, the ability of the globe to address the big issues like climate change. And that actually will disproportionately hurt some of the less fortunate countries. Competitive coexistence is an interesting one and one I think I might favor uh, if I could take a position on it. And that is the US and China prioritize growth, which uh, allows trade to be more normalized and uh, you get this economic collaboration that exists where military play gets uh, reduced um, and you're really competing more economically and trying to influence through uh, the economy rather than through, uh, through military means. The fourth scenario is separate silos. And this is kind of like the rollerball economy where you have economic and security blocks that are created where um, you align with like-minded uh, nations to uh, form what you believe is your protective bubble. And uh, you use your size and capability to do what you wanna do with that. Um, it's about defense and being self-sufficient and resilient and not getting caught up where you're uh, beholden to any one country uh, for your needs. Um, and then you end up with these little groups that are all kind of playing together, but not uh, with each other, but not, but competing against each other. So inside those areas, you have a free flow of information, trade, uh, uh, and the like, and in innovation, but you use that as your competitive advantage against the others. Um, that, that really hurts the developing nations again, because a lot of them will be left behind and some will fail. And you're seeing what the pandemic's creating these vulnerabilities. Imagine if you uh, don't have much to offer and are being left on the outside, how do you, how do you deal with that? You're gonna get drains of capital and, and human capital flowing to other areas. This last scenario is a scary one. <clears throat> Basically in the tragedy and mobilization, they see that in the thirties, the scenario plays out that you have a global food crisis that's brought about by climate change issues that have been too long ignored. And then you have these non-government organizations that work together to uh, where the rich and poor nations decide that the problem's so great that they all have to pull together and support each other to get out of the problem. And that it's driven by a, a food catastrophe, as I mentioned, the richer ones help the poorer nations and how does that play out? Um, so these are the five scenarios that they've laid out. It's a fascinating report. I'll put it into the uh, mix here, but what I find so interesting about this is there's no uh, particularly agenda for these 19 government agencies to put out because they can't make policy with it. They can only inform what they think the possibilities are. So I guess as Yogi Berra said, uh, the future ain't what it used to be. And I think that's what we're going to find when we come out of the, uh, in 20 years from now, what the world will look like so different. And it'll be interesting to see how many of these scenarios actually, which one of these scenarios plays out, if any. So Mark, with that, I'll stop there. That's tough because we, we really need to pursue all these themes. This was, I lost track of time just listening to you. So technically we have no time, but I'd like to buy five minutes um, if I could borrow it from the cannabis group, just to see if there are any uh, transitory questions or the, and then we can, I think we should definitely have a follow-up on, on those themes, Stephen. And any, any quick questions from, the, from everyone? Can't compete with cannabis, Mark. I, I have a million questions, questions but what, um, well, I want Steven, I, I want at least one, one or two, just because it's you just hit Steven, so many times. Steven, what's the most important thing of everything that you spoke about that we should take away? I think the conflict between the needs of society and the ability of governments to respond to those needs when they're so short-term oriented. And I've said this on many calls when I talk about China, but every 
developed nations should take a page out of China's book for a longer term view, because the only way you can solve big issues, you can't do it by throwing money at it and expect you're going to solve structural issues that are uh, as extensive as we have them. Is Biden's infrastructure uh, longer term? Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Uh, I, yes, but I, I think in context, it's I, I suspect the way we'll do infrastructure will be um, election cycle infrastructure and, and instead of dealing with the underlying real uh, systemic issues, uh, I think we'll short arm it and it won't be enough. Last question. Before we transfer over. I think the main, the main, um, the main point is, you know, what, what does this mean for the, the investment landscape, right? And does this, does this usher a new era of big governments that are, you know, which, which we may be going to in the U.S. as, as, as a solver of, of these type of issues, or is there going to be more public-private uh, cooperation, uh, which generally tends to be a little bit better? Um, you know, I, I liken the, the whole environment to, you know, this, this well, while, while not being World War II, the tragedy is, is of, of, you know, it's, it's, it's big. It's big in proportions, right? And the response to World War II was institutions, right? Greg, IMF, Bretton Woods. Greg, sorry. Uh, I'm, and the, we're, in a, we're trying to transition. Any, any oh, that's part? fine. No, no, no. The point was, the point was, what, what's it going to mean for investment flows and, and, and what's the world, new world order that's going to emerge from that? I, I thought the presentation was brilliant, Stephen. But thanks, Greg. But I think you bring on the highlight one big point, Mark, which is I don't think governments, given their financial positions right now, can do it alone. And I do think it has to be a combination of the innovation of the private sector uh, combined with the support of the government with the right regulations and the right tax structures globally that's going to help get you out of this problem. And the report actually made the point you made, Greg, this is the biggest problem the world's faced since World War II. So... Again, we're going to transition over. For those who are new to 361 Firm, we do this every Tuesday. We've done it 54 weeks in a row where Stephen Burke shares some macro theme. Uh, this, this one was rather uh, went right up to the edge and we didn't have Q&A. 